Good morning. Thanks for being here. I'm Stephen Romo in for Joe Fryer and Savannah Sellers today. Right now on Morning News Now, historic storm. More than 60 people are now dead after the massive winter storm. that wreaked havoc across the U.S. And most of the deaths are in the Buffalo, New York area, where more people have died now than in any other snowstorm in recent history. Several roads in that region are still impassable, and the cleanup process is expected to be a long one. We have the latest from Buffalo and the much-needed relief that could be on the way. Ripple effects. The Southwest Airlines cancellation mess at airports continues around the country this morning. The airline already cut more than 2,000 flights today, with some passengers stranded now for multiple days. We'll show you the latest situation at airports and what Southwest is now saying about what happened. Staying in place, the Supreme Court votes to keep the Trump era border policy known as Title 42 in effect. We'll explain what this means for the surge of migrants waiting to enter the U.S. and what comes next. Also this morning, saving Christmas, a group of strangers trapped in a Target store as the blizzard battered the Buffalo region on Christmas, but that did not stop them from keeping the holiday spirit alive. We'll talk to a mother who was inside that store with her kids coming up a bit later this hour. And we begin this morning with the latest on the cleanup and the aftermath from that historic winter weather. This morning, it's still having a huge impact across the country on the ground and in the air. At least 65 people are now confirmed dead from that storm across the country. And 34 of those deaths are in upstate New York in what's become the deadliest story in the city of Buffalo's history. A driving ban remains in effect for Buffalo, where streets are still littered with hundreds of abandoned cars. Erie County's executive now pleading with people to stay off the roads. Roads that are completely blocked right now that have no access whatsoever. And people are trying to drive into on these roads or trying to get into these neighborhoods and they can't. Please, please, you heard the mayor beg, I'm begging, stay home. You hear the desperation there. Well, there is some good news today as Buffalo Niagara International Airport is expected to reopen after crews removed snow from more than two miles of runway. Meanwhile, in the aftermath of that storm, there was also a travel nightmare specifically affecting Southwest Airlines passengers nationwide. Thousands of flights have already been canceled this week and those headaches are likely to continue. We have much more on the major travel disruptions on Southwest ahead, including NBC's Shamari Jones in Baltimore Regional, Baltimore, Washington International Airport, and more from the Points Guy Managing Editor, Clint Henderson. We'll check in with meteorologist Angie Lastman for the forecast as well. But we begin with NBC News correspondent Marissa Perra in Buffalo. Marissa, good morning to you. So the temperatures there expected to warm up through the end of the week. That is some good news. Of course, we'll help with the snow problem there. But what's it looking like right now? Yeah, so you can probably see behind me that these main roads are passable. We're seeing some cars able to drive past us, even though that driving ban is in effect. But you never know where they're on their way to. They may be part of the cleanup process. But the thing to keep in mind is that driving ban is in effect because they are still in the process of clearing roads, of taking away those cars that were left behind and abandoned when that snowstorm was really at its heaviest. So, yes, the cleanup is underway. We we have seen public transit just barely starting to pick up as life starts to resume the way they knew it before the snowstorm. Well, it was just over a month ago when Western New York also got hit with several feet of snow, Marissa. So I'm sure people were affected by both of those storms. Do we know how they're doing? Yeah, so we've actually had a chance to talk with a number of them. We were actually here on the ground this last time. And before I kind of go into the differences between the two of them, I want to take you to one man our crews found. He was actually in true Buffalo style outside of his home on his front lawn, drinking a beer with his pal. Here's what he had to say. Keep up with it a little bit better. 
because it came in a little bit more waves where this just dumped and you know you couldn't keep up with it when it was you know 79 mile per hour winds and two degrees outside you, you can't come out and shovel at all but before it was a little bit warmer less winds so we could come out and shovel constantly but this one it's this is our first chance really to shovel it's, it's a lot heavier um and just a lot more of it so in true lake effect form, the snow totals are always going to vary depending on the neighborhood you're in, depending on the street. So that's always going to vary. Um, in general, though, looking as a whole, the snow was less. The snow total was less this time around. But here's where things got so deadly and so much worse. It was so much colder. The wind speed was much higher. So really, at its peak, we saw wind chills of negative 20 degrees. And that is why we're seeing the death total that we are this time around. Surprising there to hear the snow was actually last. And of course, that snow is eventually going to melt. And the temperatures are expected to rise there. So what potential problems come next? Right. So when you have all of the snow that is gathered, melting so quickly, there is always the question of, well, where does that precipitation go, right? What comes up must come down. When you have ice that is melting, it turns into water of some kinds and the concern is that it's supposed to rain this weekend they're going to get temperatures in the 40s and the 50s which is really going to accelerate that snow melt and on top of that they're getting rain on top of that so there are concerns about that but i think right now everyone's trying to prepare for that while also getting cleanup underway right handling one thing at a time here one thing at a time is all they can do all right marissa thanks so much and let's get a check of your morning news now weather. Angie Lastman, good morning to you. So lots of people want to know how their forecast is shaping up. What you got for us? Yeah, a roller coaster ride. I hope you guys like roller coasters because we were dealing with the Arctic air last week and, of course, the snow falling that Marissa was just talking about. And now we're going to see a big warm-up. Places like Denver hit 50 degrees today. That is more than 70 degrees warmer than where we were in Denver just six days ago. So big temperature swing, and it's not just Denver. It spreads to the east. Indianapolis makes it to the 40s today. Memphis at 55 degrees and a whopping 71 degrees for Austin later this afternoon. Now, these temperatures are above normal and this continues here as we go even into tomorrow. 60 degrees for Nashville, Pittsburgh at 48 degrees, 10 degrees above where we normally should be for this time of year. Into the 70s for Jacksonville, a big difference from what they were dealing with yesterday and even earlier this morning where we were still seeing temperatures uh, close to freezing in many locations. As we look ahead to the holiday weekend, places like Buffalo, Marissa mentioned that it is going to warm up, and indeed it is. 50 degrees by Friday. They are expecting some rain. I'll show you why here in a moment. It's really going to depend that flooding on just how much rain they get. But temperatures do stay into the mid-40s to upper 40s even through the weekend and into the new year. That goes for New York as well. Warmer conditions on the way for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday into the 50s. Our biggest uh, issue over the next couple of days are going to be these multiple storms that come on shore on the West Coast. That's really where the bulk of the activity is going to be. And this last one that we saw bring rain to folks in Washington, Oregon, California yesterday continues to move to the east, bringing plenty of snow and as well some, some really strong winds to folks in the Rockies and northern and central Rockies through the day today. They get ready for another storm system. This is going to be multiple rounds of this that we see over the coming days. Four to five storms are going to move on shore for folks on the west coast. This is good for their drought. Not so good when it comes all at once. We could be dealing with some flash flooding concerns. So that's one thing we will monitor. Snow in those higher elevations, the mountainous regions, expect that. And we'll also be watching for with those, those periods of heavy rain continuing over, you know, through Friday, we'll likely see some of that uh, flash flooding concern as well. Now, that system that I showed you came on shore yesterday and is impacting folks in Denver and places like that bringing snow. That eventually is going to sweep across the plains. We will see a severe potential for uh, Texas, Arkansas, and Louisiana on Thursday. If you're traveling places like Dallas, Houston, we could watch for some impacts there. That rain continues to spread to the east as that storm tracks to the east, too. This is what is going to bring some potential rain to folks in Buffalo, extending all the way down to the Gulf Coast, really. And this could also have a, a potential for some strong winds as well. There's the bullseye for the, the storms here as we get into Thursday. Uh, but if you're traveling today, the hot spots are going to be, or I guess I should say trouble spots, Seattle, Salt Lake City, Phoenix. Watch for those locations. East Coast looks great, even through Thursday into Friday. It'll start to get a little bumpy here as we get into Saturday and Sunday, but 
that New Year's outlook, if you have plans, maybe for New Year's Eve, do you have plans? I do, but um, I've tried to put them on hold after the disaster over Christmas. Those temperatures, though, cannot believe that. And you might need your rain gear if you're going to be Ooh. out anywhere, really, in the East Coast. You weren't kidding about that roller But warm. Warm? All right, I'll take it. Angie, thanks so much. All right, taking a closer look now at how the winter weather is causing a nationwide travel nightmare. Thousands of travelers have been hit with mass cancellations, specifically by Southwest Airlines, leaving so many people stranded, some of them quite far from home. Nearly 70% of the airline's scheduled flights were canceled on Monday. And company officials say more cancellations are expected today and tomorrow. My husband and I had our flights canceled by Southwest, like so many others did. Here's a look at our journey back home. Monday morning at 10.30 a.m. in St. Louis, and this is the line of Southwest passengers trying to rebook flights after being canceled. My husband and I are trying to get back to New York among these other frustrated flyers. Southwest abruptly canceled our flight this morning without giving us a reason. Now, the phone system is down right now, but earlier they told us we couldn't get back until Friday. The line here for the ticket counter stretches all the way across the building, but the TSA line is all but deserted, giving you some indication of how many flights are actually getting out. By Monday afternoon, after waiting for three and a half hours to talk to a ticket agent, we got booked on standby. But then overnight came the inevitable news. There was no text message, no email. I just checked the app and another Southwest flight cancellation. So now renting a car, going to a different city, different airport, different airline, trying to make it back. With a reservation on a United flight out of Louisville, we needed to drive four hours. But rental cars were booked up in the St. Louis area. After a bunch of calls, we got a reservation, a half an hour's drive away. But then... Your destination is on the left. We discovered there were a lot of people waiting around for those cars. Oh, no. So an update. Arrive at the place this morning. It was a glitch in the system that allowed us to book a car because they had none available. So right now we're scrambling to find a rental car so we can drive four hours to Louisville, Kentucky and make our flight. But at least we have our luggage. The producer for this story is also stuck in Missouri, busy working on this report. So Noah Frick Aloff's mom went to try to find his lost bag. It could not be located in this sad sea of suitcases. A Southwest Airlines employee just told my mom I won't be getting my bag back. I'll be headed back to New York without my luggage and not on Southwest. Their rebooking website shows the next available flight will be this Sunday. So instead, I'm driving five hours to Chicago and taking an American Airlines flight back to New York. So the next leg of the journey, we haven't been able to find a rental car anywhere from Illinois to Indiana on our way to Louisville. So we've had to borrow my in-laws vehicle, their personal vehicle. And even when we finally make it back to New York, the journey's not over because they're going to have to find the time to drive all the way to the Louisville airport to pick up the vehicle. So I happen to have the best in-laws in the world. They still have to go pick up that vehicle. Spoiler alert, I did make it back to New York. A lot of people had it a lot worse than we did, though. Southwest Airlines already canceled about 2,500 flights to date, nearly 1,400 for tomorrow. So for more on all this, let's bring in NBC News correspondent Shamari Stone. Who Good morning, Stephen. I'm here Baltimore. at BWI, and I tell you, I've talked to passengers this morning, and many of them tell me that they are very frustrated. Take a look right over here. Look at this screen. We have approximately, I counted, 60 or more uh, canceled flights right here. You can see this is all Southwest Airlines. And over here, a sea of luggage. Take a look. These people right here who work for Southwest Airlines are sorting this luggage and you have suitcases and bags at the staging area set up for travelers to get them back. Crews most likely removed these bags from canceled flights or they were lost in transit over the last few days. And it's a similar scene at some airports across the nation, such as in Chicago and New York. Although many airlines were forced to cancel flights, Southwest Airlines had the most, more than 70% of its flights on Monday. That's around 2,900 flights, according to Flight Aware. Now, 
Southwest airline officials are, again, trying to sort these bags. The goal is to try and get them back to the passengers. We talked to one woman who told me that this is absolutely ridiculous, and she came here to try and get her bag, and she claims that Southwest Airlines can't find it. Back to you, Stephen. All right, a huge mess out there, Shamari. So if you would stand by. Also want to bring in Clint Henderson, the Points Guy Managing Editor. So Clint, what led up to all these problems for Southwest? So many people asking about this. Was it actually the weather or was something else going on? I am so sorry that you were caught up in that mess, and it really is a mess. Uh, so part of it was weather. It was triggered certainly by the weather. Uh, but part of the issue is that Southwest goes point to point. They don't have a hub and spoke system, which works great in normal operations. But when things start to go wrong, it's a domino effect. And next thing you know, planes and crews are completely out of position. In this case, you also had a technological issue with some of the back-end software engineering and IT systems just completely overwhelmed. Southwest has been investing in these systems, but clearly they haven't invested enough, especially as they've expanded. So you've got a combination of the weather, uh, staffing issues, and then of course, not being able to even schedule uh, flight attendants, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just been a, a total disaster. Yeah, I've spoken to many flight attendants as well. They've had plenty of trouble. And uh, Clint, we also heard from Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg about how the Department of Transportation is handling this breakdown. Let's listen. They told me in their words that they will go above and beyond their written customer service plan. Uh, I'm going to be holding them accountable for doing that. Does that mean financial compensation? Absolutely. At a minimum, there need to be cash refunds for uh, the, the canceled flights, and uh, they need to be taking care of passengers where uh, they got stuck with meals, hotel compensation. Now, they've, they've put up a website to uh, get those kinds of requests in. So I'm sure there's going to be a lot of requests, Clint. So what are passengers owed when something like this happens, and how can they actually get compensated? So this is the concerning thing. There's a lot of wiggle room, especially if an airline can blame weather. They don't technically have to pay you back. Now, I will say Southwest has said they will reimburse passenger for reasonable expenses they've incurred, uh, rebooking themselves, getting meals, you know, getting Ubers like you tried to do, uh, booking themselves in other airlines. But that word reasonable has a lot of wiggle room in it. And it, it, we really are going to be expecting the government to hold Southwest accountable to reimburse people for all these costs they've incurred. Some people can't even afford to rebook themselves and they've been stuck at airports. So uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure on Southwest to make it right for consumers. And so far, they're saying the right words. Well, Shamari, I wanted to ask yeah. you, the Southwest CEO, Bob Jordan, he's responded to this meltdown. What's he saying and how do they try to climb out of this? I don't have much time here left. Well, he's saying that this is unacceptable in terms of the performance and Southwest Airlines has apologized. Let's take a listen. I want everyone who is dealing with the problems we've been facing, whether you haven't been able to get to where you need to go, or you're one of our heroic employees caught up in a massive effort to stabilize the airline, uh, to know is that we're doing everything we can to return to a normal operation. And please also hear that I'm truly sorry. Now back out here live, this was just put up moments ago. You can see here, it says LAX. That's where this bag belongs. Take a look right here. You got Dallas. And keep in mind, we are in Baltimore right now. San Francisco, Houston, and come right over here, Florida. Coincidentally, the woman I talked to who said that this is ridiculous, well, she says her bag is being sent back to Florida. A lot of confusion for people. Some people tell me that they slept in hotels, they're stranded, they're trying to rebook their flights. Some are having a longer vacation with their family and friends. The goal right now is to get back home and get all their luggage. Back to you, Stephen. So many people in rough situations. Shamari, Clint, thank you both so much. All right, turning to some breaking news we're following now out of the Vatican on the health of former Pope Benedict. The Vatican says the 95-year-old's condition has worsened over the last few hours. NBC News foreign correspondent Megan Fitzgerald joins us now for more on this. So, Megan, what exactly do we know about Benedict's condition? 
Well, as you mentioned, you know, that was certainly shocking news that we heard overnight from Pope Francis saying and confirming that former Pope Benedict, uh, his health right now is uh, he's very sick. We also know from the Vatican just releasing the statement moments ago saying that uh, the former Pope Benedict uh, had a sudden worsening of his health in recent hours due to his age, but that he's under constant um, monitoring by uh, medical doctors that are watching closely and that right now his condition is under control. But, uh, you know, keep in mind, we're talking about a former pope that's 95 years old and that his health had been deteriorating in, in the last several years. And we know that uh, Pope Francis has kept in close contact with him over the last several years, visiting him constantly, uh, most recently just this morning. Um, but, of course, this is a very concerning situation uh, for not only those within the Vatican, but certainly across the world. Yeah, a whole lot of people paying attention to this, Megan. And Pope Francis is actually the one who revealed his predecessor's condition just before we heard that statement from the Vatican. What was the Pope's message on this? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, and so the Pope is asking for the world to, to, to pray. I mean, we know that he's 95 years old, that he isn't in the best of health. He hasn't been in the best of health. Now we're understanding uh, that it's, it's, it's deteriorating rapidly. Um, but he is asking the world to pray at this point. Uh, and of course, the world is paying close attention. We, of course, will be following this closely uh, to keep an eye on how he is doing, um, because obviously this is a, a very touch and go situation. Now, we know he stepped down, Benedict did, a decade ago. He's been Pope Emeritus since. Do we know, has he been in poor health in recent months? And what kind of role has he been playing before this? Yeah, so we know that his health has been deteriorating at 95 years old. And, you know, over the last several years, as you know, he's sort of uh, taken a step out, a step back from the public eye. Uh, you know, he, he certainly made history, though, when he was elected in 2005. Uh, he was the first German pope in a thousand years to be elected. Uh, and then, of course, he was 78 years old, being the oldest pope to ever be elected at that point, uh, until he stepped down in 2013. Uh, and, of course, that was a, a huge step. I mean, we, we've never seen a pope do that in over 600 years. Uh, and he said at the point that he did that, uh, that it was a lack of strength of mind and body. That, of course, was something that was unheard of to see a pope step down. Uh, but again, right now, all eyes are on former Pope Benedict's health as the world is praying uh, for his condition. Him Stephen? stepping down was a, a big surprise to everyone. All right, Megan, we'll check back in with you. Thanks so much. And coming up on Morning News Now, a controversial border policy will remain in place. The Supreme Court has voted to keep the Trump era Title 42 policy in effect, just how long it could stay in place and what it means for migrants along the border. That's next. Welcome back. A controversial immigration policy that allows asylum seekers to be turned away at the border will remain in place for now. In a five to four decision, the Supreme Court ruled to extend Title 42 as an emergency measure, followed by a request by 19 states that wanted to prevent it from expiring. More than two million people have been expelled at the border since the pandemic era policy started back in 2020. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos joins us now for more on this. So Danny, good to have you with us. If you could walk us through this Supreme Court decision, what's their thinking behind keeping it? Procedurally, it's complicated. And the reason I say that is that any time you have stays involved and appeals of stays, it gets really hard to keep straight what exactly is happening at each level of the court. But basically, this is about a stay. In other words, the court preserves the status quo. In other words, what do we do uh, with the current situation while this case plays itself out? Because the reality is most cases take years to resolve. So in a situation like this, do we decide to let uh, the uh, administration continue this order or do we strike it down while we wait? Keeping in mind that this isn't about the merits. It's about what do we do while we wait for this case to wend its way through the courts. And uh, at its core is really a question of whether or not the Biden administration can be forced to continue a Trump era uh, order that is based on Title 42. It's not the law itself. It's a the Trump administration's interpretation of the power granted to it, specifically the CDC, under Title 42. And that law is about what can we do to prevent people coming in in response to a pandemic. It's a, a hundred years old law that dealt with a situation back in the day when you had a ship coming into the New York Harbor and you kept it out 
in the bay because it might have, I don't know, scurvy or some disease or something like that. That's not the situation now. These are people that are already in the country. So it's interesting to take a look at the historical context and how the needs have changed so dramatically that it doesn't really even reflect the original intent of the law. Yeah, a fascinating history of it. And we know Neil Gorsuch was the only conservative on the court who uh, voted this way. Do we know his thinking behind this? Sure, because uh, the majority simply issued a very basic order. But Neil Gorsuch showed his work along with the other members of the dissenting group. And it's a couple pages, but Neil Gorsuch has a way of getting right to the point. And the bottom line is this. His argument is essentially, what are we fighting about? As it is, everybody agrees that this original order was based on a crisis that is over. The government, the Biden administration, admits that the crisis is over. The states have argued in other contexts that the COVID-19 crisis is over. So what happens if mm. we allow this to go on and, and it uh, uh, reaches the merits? What are the merits? There are no merits anymore because at its core, at the end of this case, no matter what, will be a conclusion that the original need for this order is over. So Gorsuch's dissent is basically, what do we hear about? Interesting point, though, some of those 19 states saying that the pandemic is over. Quickly here, I wanted to ask the Supreme Court going to hear oral arguments in February, a decision by June. What, what's the future of this? Uh, it's hard to say because the Supreme Court schedules things at its own uh, desire whim. This is a request for expedited review. So what does that mean? Well, you know, in my jaded view, it usually means however important your case is before the court. If you're a run-of-the-mill case, like my case is on appeal, and they're not in the media, then ah, the court gets to it when it wants to. But the Supreme Court uh, is its own kingdom, and it can decide to hear things on expedited review and define expedited the way it wants. Mm. All right. More to come on that for sure. Danny Savalos, thanks for helping us break that down. All right, and turning now to the latest on the war in Ukraine and the recently liberated southern city of Kherson. It's coming under attack again by Russian forces, according to the Ukrainian military. Heavy fighting has also been reported in the eastern part of that country. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley joins us now from Kyiv with the latest on all this. Matt. That's right, Stephen. Kherson has endured near constant attacks this week. There were about two dozen Russian projectiles struck the city overnight, it's after dozens more earlier in the week. This morning, Ukraine's southern city of Kherson under fire once again. Only weeks ago, these civilians were welcoming Ukrainian liberators. Now, new Russian bombardments, including the shelling of a maternity ward Tuesday, according to the Ukrainian government, have sent them fleeing. Russian artillery attacks on Christmas Eve killed 11 people, according to the region's governor. <laughs> Tomorrow's son is among her son's dead. I urged him to wake up and leave the house, but he didn't, and that was it, she said. Our lives are ruined. But the fiercest battles are in the east, like Bakhmut. Among Ukraine's longest battles so far, a violent crucible for the wider war. Bakhmut, Kremina, and other areas in Donbass require maximum strength and concentration now, Ukraine's president said. The situation there is difficult and painful. The constant drumbeat of war, now a routine rhythm for many. You kind of get used to it, said this man. You don't even look or listen carefully to what is happening and where. That's how we are now. But still, I want to live a normal life. After five months of fighting, there's little here left to destroy, except lives. Like Volodymyr Yezhov's, a video game designer who was killed in Bakhmut just before Christmas. He always cared about other people more than himself, said his friend. And diplomacy reached another impasse this week. Russia announcing it will ban oil sales to any country that imposes a U.S.-led cap on what it can charge. The move may limit the West's ability to punish Moscow. But on Ukraine's home front, energy is also in short supply. Ukrainian civilians huddled through a cold, dark Christmas amidst electricity outages, war-weary but still celebrating as best they can. And Stephen, just to give you a sense of the toll this has taken on the civilian population as we enter the 11th month of this war, the United Nations is reporting today that about 40% of the Ukrainian population, that's about 18 million people, need humanitarian assistance. But only about 7% say they want to leave. Stephen? Wow. And nearly entering the 11th month. Math Bradley, thanks so much.
All right, more international headlines now. Kim Jong-un announces big plans to boost North Korean military power in the next year. NBC News foreign correspondent Ali Aruzi joins us now with that and more. Ali, good morning. Good morning, Stephen. That's right. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has presented plans to grow and strengthen the country's military power next year in a clear sign that he plans to continue with provocative weapons tests. This year, the North has already conducted a record number of missile tests in an attempt to modernize its arsenal and gain leverage both in Seoul and Washington. At least 25 people have been killed in the Philippines by rain-induced flooding, while a desperate search and rescue mission is underway to find dozens more who are missing, most of whom are fishermen. Authorities say that the floods and the landslides are unlike previous disasters in the Philippines, which are typically triggered by much more severe typhoons. And finally, China will start issuing passports and visas for tourism as it takes another big step away from its zero COVID policy, setting up a potential flood of Chinese tourists going abroad for next month's lunar holiday. But as China dismantles its strict policy, other countries are implementing measures to restrict or at least test travelers from China due to renewed concerns over spreading the infection. And those are your international headlines, Stephen. All right. A lot of updates there, Ali. Thank you. And coming up on Morning News Now, despite strides against the COVID pandemic in 2022, there was no shortage of concerning medical headlines. From new variants to the MPOX outbreak, we'll take a look at the big health takeaways from this past year and what it could mean for 2023. From COVID to RSV and monkeypox to polio, there was no shortage of concerning medical headlines this year. NBC News uh, medical fellow Dr. Akshay Sayal joins us now for a look at the top medical stories of 2022, and there were a whole lot of them, Doc. So we want to start with the so-called triple demic. That's RSV, flu, and COVID. Of course, a lot of people concerned about that right now. So what's our outlook as we head into 2023? Hey, good morning, Stephen. You know, we started out with this triple demic. We sort of started out with RSV, and, you know, that seems to have peaked and is on the decline, at least on a national level. You know, now we're worried about flu and we're worried about COVID. So flu, where we stand, is, you know, things tend to be a little bit of a slow burn right now. It's not accelerating too much, and it's not declining. It's kind of just staying put. Um, but what we're worried about is COVID, and we're seeing signs that COVID may be starting to come back a little bit. And any time that starts to come back, you worry about how hospitalizations and how deaths could start to rise as a result of that. But heading into 2023, what we're worried about, you know, we're expected cases to rise. Everyone's flying around. People are stuck in airports, as, as mm. you know a lot about. That's true. Um, so with all that, you know, interaction, we're worried about our case is going to rise. Is that going to lead to a downstream effect of a rise in hospitalizations? And is that rise in hospitalizations going to lead to a rise in deaths? But because we have the tools now, we're hopeful that those will stay at a minimum. Yeah, absolutely. Hoping that. And we also want to talk about MPOX. That's formerly known as monkeypox. It seemed like over the summer that was going to be a big health crisis. Lots of people were talking about it. The White House saying that their protocols worked on this. So where are we right now and what's the outlook of MPOX? Yeah, so MPOX was really, really peaking back in August and back in the summer, you know, especially among the gay community. We were hitting about over 500 cases a day. You know, now where we're at, we're at less than 10 cases a day. And the Biden administration recently saying, they're not going to extend the public health emergency for this. They think that we have it under control. And, you know, in large part in credit to the people that were affected, you know, there was, there was data out that came out after the monkey or the MPOX outbreak came out, you know, showing that people were actually abstaining from high risk sexual behaviors. Um, so I think that really targeted messaging towards the group that was affected, the gay community, um, really helped bring those cases down. There was such a huge effort for the vaccine as well. Also wanted to talk to you about uh, Roe versus Wade overturned. Of course, that uh, had a lot of uh, impacts uh, on the medical side of things. What is the, the fallout from that decision? You know, it's unfortunate. A lot of the fallout which still remains to be seen. But, you know, what we're expecting is because, you know, Af African-American women are the group that's highest, most likely to get abortions, we are worried that they're going to be the most likely to be affected, meaning that, you know, the overturning of Roe v. Wade could have effects in health disparities. Because if, if you can't get abortions and you're in a restricted state, you're going to have to travel to, to other states. 
And because of, you know, structural racism and inequality, people who, who are most likely to get an abortion are most likely to need an abortion. We're worried they're not going to be the ones able to get up worsening those health disparities. Now, that's on the patient side. But on the doctor side, we worry about, you know, medical students and residents who are in restrictive states. How are they going to be training in these abortion procedures if it's legal to perform them? Hmm. A lot of aspects to that still yet to be seen. And quickly wanted to ask you about the issue of climate change, actually looking at it from a health perspective now. Yeah, you know, we, we talked to some experts at Harvard's Climate Center, and, you know, what they're worried about is these shock events, these extreme events, really highlighting the, the in, 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 problems with our infrastructure in hospitals and in outpatient clinics. Because if we see these extreme events like Hurricane Ian or flooding or natural disasters, are patients going to have access to medications? Are they going to be able to go to their dialysis, their infusion centers to get cancer medication? So I think those extreme events are really what we're going to be watching for. And how, can we sustain the impact of those? All right, lots of headlines have uh, health impacts. Thanks for helping us break that down, Dr. Akshay Sahal. We appreciate it. All right, and coming up on Morning News Now, the pandemic has changed how basically we all work. But now, nearly three years in, is the work from home life here to stay? Or could a potential recession affect all that? We're taking a look. Coming up next. Welcome back. Since the start of the COVID pandemic back in 2020, many of us were forced to work from home. But as those health concerns ease over the past year, more and more companies have been asking people to come back to the office for at least a few days a week. Mark Ein is the chairman of Castle Systems, a company that's been tracking this trend. He joins us now. Good morning, Mark. Thanks for being with us. So what is your data showing about the number of people who actually did have to return to the office this year? Yeah, so so the number has been steadily rising throughout the year. At the beginning of the year, office utilization was around 25 percent. It quickly got up to 30 percent. We're now in the high 40s on a national average. It's 48 uh, percent. There is a wide disparity in markets between the low market of San Jose, which is actually 35 percent, and Austin, which is 65 percent. But in general, the markets are up between 50 and 100 percent from where they were at the beginning of the year. Wow, impressive numbers. Well, we know a lot of employees just do not want to go back to the office for a variety of reasons. Many people like the flexible hybrid work situations. Do you think that that is going to be here to stay in some capacity or are companies going to keep pushing harder for people to return? Yes, so when you go one level deeper, what you see, the numbers I just quoted are the average across the week. What you see is there's an increasing disparity between the low days of the week and the high days of the week. So at the beginning of the year on a national average, the difference between the low day of the week, which is generally Friday and the high day was only 9% difference. Now that difference um, on a national level is 22%. And so what you're seeing is that people are having people come back, but they're saying come back on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and giving people more flexibility generally on Monday and Fridays. And so. I think there's two themes. One is, yes, people are coming back to work in greater numbers, but B, companies are giving people more flexibility towards a hybrid workplace. So looking into 2023, how do you see things shaping up next year, especially with a potential recession that could be on the horizon here? Yeah, so we've been saying since really since shortly after the pandemic started that business leaders have been very eager to get their people back to work that they um, really feel like, whether it's part-time or all the time, that their teams are more productive and people are more productive if they're in their office some of the time. Until sometime mid this year when the economy turned, they were afraid to be tough with mandates because A, the economy was roaring and they had a bit of a cushion, and B, the labor market was really tight. And what we've been saying was, as the economy turned and the labor market turned, you'll see companies be stronger in their mandates. You saw a lot of companies, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Apple, who stated policies of getting people back, but they couldn't enforce them. What we've seen increasingly this year as the economies softened is that companies are getting tougher about requiring people to follow the rules and come back. We think that's going to continue. Both the economy looks like it's going to soften, the labor market will soften, and business leaders really want their people back, if not all the time, at least some of the time. A lot of people are eagerly awaiting any new directives for 2023. All right, Mark Ein, thanks for helping us break that down.
All right, turning now to Christmas. Now that many of the presents are unwrapped and we start thinking about taking down those Christmas decorations, many people wondering what to do with their natural Christmas trees. Well, Tim O'Connor is the executive director of the National Christmas Tree Association and joins us with a few ideas on that. Good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. So first off, tell us exactly how American communities recycle these trees. I'm guessing there's a lot of different methods across U.S. cities. Well, good morning, and yes, that's true. Uh, every community does something different, and, and there's not a, a national directory uh, that you can turn to. You really need to look at your local resources to find out what's going on in your community, and, and it will be different uh, in different parts of the country. Typically, uh, it's run by the, the local government, and uh, um, the most frequent way trees are disposed of is mulching. And that's often done um, by the park districts in local communities where the mulch is used both by the park district and offered to the community at large to come in and pick up some mulch. But you do have to check and learn what's going on, you know, where you live. Yeah, mulch a lot better than just uh, ending up in a landfill there. So uh, what are some other uses for old Christmas trees that people can think of? Well, it's it's always unique. I mean, wherever your tree goes, it is a product of nature. It is fully biodegradable. Uh, but yes, uh, as you can see, what you're showing now, they, they are used uh, as erosion control. You can, you can use them around uh, sand dune areas. They can also be used in stream banks. Uh, they often get used as fish habitat as well. They get put out on frozen lakes. And then as the lakes thaw, the trees will sink and they allow fish to get in the branches of the tree and lay eggs and be safe from predators. Uh, some of the more unique ways trees have been used, uh, you can go on uh, the internet with a little searching and find zoos that provide them to animals as toys. And you can see uh, you know, elephants carrying them around and lions and bears wrestling with them and having a good time with a Christmas tree that's <laughs> no longer in the home. Wow, fish, bears, lions, oh my, like all that. I uh, also wanted to ask a lot of people just, they have their Christmas trees, they don't know what to do with them, they, they try Googling. Is there a better way to find out what to do in your community to try to get rid of your natural tree? You know, it, it really is so unique to each community what they do. The, the best thing would be to start looking at your local resources, such as your city government, uh, or perhaps it might be your park district, as it is here in Denver where I'm located, or it could be your local trash system. Um, but there's no one one right answer for every you know community in America. It is, a, it is one of the most local things on how it's handled and so the best I can tell you is, is begin checking locally uh, to learn. Good advice there. I've lived in a lot of cities. One thing I keep hearing, make sure you take all that tinsel, all those decorations down first. All right, Tim, thanks so much for that information. Thank you. And coming up on Morning News Now, a trip to the store turned into a Christmas that a group of strangers will never forget. They were trapped inside a Buffalo area target storm during the snow. A mother who was inside that store with her kids will join us next with how they kept their holiday spirit alive. Welcome back. Money may not be the key to happiness, but... $640 million is sure to make you smile. It turns out no one has won that Mega Millions jackpot yet, which means the prize is going up again. This year's prize estimated to be the sixth largest in jackpot history, with the odds of winning roughly one and more than $302 million. If you haven't bought a ticket yet, you still have some time. The last drawing of 2022 is Friday. Who knows? Your $2 lottery ticket could turn into $640 million. The true definition of making a quick buck, or in this case, a, a quick million or so. Not bad. All right, well, it sounds like the plot of a holiday movie. A group of strangers trapped together in a Target for two days over Christmas Eve. Well, it actually happened in a small upstate New York town near Buffalo. 
Jessica Sibniski was one of those customers in that Target trapped with her boyfriend and kids. She joins us now to talk about all of that. So, Jessica, good morning to you. This is literally the stuff of movies. So tell us at first how you got stuck and what were you thinking when you realized that you weren't able to leave? Um, well, good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, so we started out trying to get across town to pick up family. Uh, we were hoping we'd make it back before the blizzard began, which we didn't. On the way home, we were completely stuck in a whiteout. Nowhere near Target. Uh, we actually used our phones as like a GPS to kind of, we traveled through, you know, our maps using our phones, you know, we were able to see like kind of where we were, what stores were nearby. Uh, thankfully, we ended up in the Target Plaza. Uh, we tried the local grocery store in the Target Plaza and they would not let us in for shelter. Um, so our next move was Target. So we pulled over and I knocked on the door and they welcomed us right in. Um, we knew we weren't leaving around five o'clock on Friday. We were gonna be stuck there for a bit. Uh, it was an adventure, to say the least. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you were seeing some photos there, an adventure, uh, the best way to put it. So how did the employees react? It seems like they were pretty helpful. They let you in anyway. Oh, yeah. Before we even got there, there were already people in there, plus the employees. Um, they, they welcomed us right in with hot chocolate and coffee from Starbucks and warm, fuzzy blankets. Um, they remained so calm. I'm not even sure how, because I was having a panic attack. <laughs> Uh, they were great. They were great to everybody. They really were. Yeah, I guess there are worse places to be. Looks like they had uh, plenty of beddings, I guess, from their houseware section. You got your Starbucks coffee. Seems like it could be a lot worse. A lot of people, though, not wanting to choose Target for their their holiday time. Hopefully you had uh, some more heart, lighthearted moments in there. Any good memories oh. to walk away with? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, well, the kids, the kids loved it. They were window shopping the entire time. Uh, <laughs> My son got a Lego set. We were drawing out with markers on Star like Starbucks paper plates. Uh, what else did we do in there? Oh, my son got to ride the motorized uh, shopping cart. Uh, we got to watch the Bills game. The Bills won. <laughs> um, yeah, we had some good memories. I've got to meet a lot of new people, hear their stories and how they ended up there. I have a lot of new Facebook friends out of it. I mean, I'm so grateful for them opening their doors to all of us. Whenever you had to go to that Target, did you ever think you would be welcomed like that, that they would be these so generous? No, you want to know what? I In my mind, I keep saying they didn't have to open their doors to any of us. They really didn't. That's not a rule in their book to open up to the public when a winter blizzard comes. So, you know, kudos to them for really doing that because so many other places were not doing it. Like, And it, it was a life or death situation out there. Yeah, so glad you guys managed to make it there in time. Jessica, thanks so much for your time this morning. Thank you. All right, thanks. and that's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But your news continues right now.